My name is John Craig. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. It's a, a very, very great pleasure to be here. Um, whenever there's an opportunity to be pulled away from enrollment data, um, all the paperwork around the few faculty positions that we're able to hire in these days of fiscal constraint, um, these are not really happy times to be Dean anyway. I didn't come here to start moaning and groaning. Um, I came here um, as an opportunity to learn something, to join with you on what is the second day, I take it, of a tremendous conference and delighted to see so many of you here um, from, I think, what is perhaps um, one of the most distinguished history departments in the world. I'm not given to hyperbole. Um, perhaps the finest um, in North America. It's a very great pleasure to introduce Professor Martin Jay, who holds the Sidney Hellman Ehrman um, Chair Professorship in uh, History at the University of California at Berkeley. And in some ways, you know, you, can, uh, you attend these sessions where people say, so-and-so needs no introduction, and the rest of you are thinking, well, actually, you know, I actually do need an introduction. So in a nutshell, here it is. Uh, Martin Jay was born in New York City. He's a graduate from Union College. Um, back in 1965, and uh, before that, he spent a year abroad at LSE. So with uh, LSE and Union College under his belt, he then went on to Harvard, where he completed his PhD in 1971, and then took up an appointment in the history department at the University of California in Berkeley, where he's been ever since. And that really has marked the start of what's been an enormously uh, productive and influential body of scholarly work which shows absolutely no sign of diminishing whatsoever. And in his time at Berkeley, he's had, you know, these fruitful stints elsewhere, Oxford, Paris, Cornell, Tulane, Dartmouth, Cambridge, and that, that's just giving you a few of the highlights. He's probably best known to many of you. Um, I'm a complete interloper. I work on ecclesiastical history in the 16th century. I actually had a lot of fun, Martin, um, with one of his recent works. This came out in the early 1990s, Downcast Eyes, the Denigration of Vision in 20th Century French Thought, partly because I was trying to pursue this, to me, vital question of when did English Protestants start praying with their eyes closed and had a lot of fun working through, uh, through your work, uh, Martin, on that front. But many of you will know him as the author of enormously influential um, work, a prize-winning work. It won the Herbert Baxter Adams Prize given out by the American Historical Association, Association for the best book in, best first book in European history. And I refer to the dialectical imagination, a history of the Frankfurt School and the Institute of Social Research, 1923 to 1950, which uh, the latest count, I think, has now been translated into 11 languages. It's one of those rare works, works which has the distinction of um, having a pirated Korean edition. Um, <laughs> and the uh, University of California um, rightly came out with the second edition in 1996. And this became the prize-winning work, which uh, certainly wasn't, um, Martin, that may not have been your very first work, but uh, that's the start of an enormously productive uh, publishing um, record of, of monographs. Um, a number of you will know a couple of more recent uh, works, The Virtues of Mendacity um, on Lying in Politics. It came out in 2010, a paperback in 2012. And then I think most recently, but uh, Martin may, may correct me, Essays from the Edge with a nod to Schopenhauer, Perega, and Paralipomena um, collection of essays in, in 2011. Um, I know it's been a long day. This, I think, is going to be an enormous treat. It, uh, would you join me in welcoming our most distinguished guest here, who's going to speak to us on Adorno and musical nominalism. Thanks very much for that enormously gracious introduction. Uh, it's a terrific privilege to be here. I'd like to thank uh, as everybody has already, Samir and uh, Cameron and the other people who made this uh, such a great success, uh, who've done the intellectual and the uh, manual labor to uh, make it work. Uh, this is a paper out of a longer project on uh, the importance of nominalism uh, in contemporary thought. And uh, it's a little technical at times in musical terms, uh, but I can assure you I'm totally uh, an amateur when it comes to music. So. Uh, don't feel overwhelmed. Uh, it uh, will, I hope, be uh, explanatory enough, uh, even for those of you who are not serious musicologists. Perhaps no concept can be more justifiably, uh, can more justifiably resist the demand to define its essence than nominalism. It was, after all, coined in the 14th century by theologians like the English Franciscan William of Ockham, who were battling against the scholastic belief in the ontological reality of universal essences. 
against the latter's version of a God who created and was then beholden to the intelligible, rational forms he had fashioned, the nominalists believed in an ineffable creator, a creator whose omniscience meant that his will could override any constraints, including those of the forms or essences he might once have posited. Natural laws, after all, natural laws can always be suspended by those unexpected and inexplicable divine interventions that we call miracles. Not surprisingly, the nominalist impulse remained powerful in voluntarist theologies, like those developed in the Reformation by Luther and Calvin. And once it was secularized with human self-assertion substituting for divine will, it could also inform modern political theories like those of Hobbes, which stressed the artificial rather than natural origins of the state. Now, as the name of their movement suggested, nominalism claimed that collective categories were no more than linguistic abstractions, generic or class names, yoking together the disparate concrete particulars whose irreducible individuality was bracketed in the service of conceptual convenience. Such words, the nominalists argued, were merely signs rather than referentially true, or more precisely, they were what a later age would call signifiers rather than signifieds. According to the distinction introduced by Duns Scotus, such generic terms uh, uh, dealt with the quiditas, or intelligible whatness of an object, rather than the hecatas, or thisness, which could be grasped only intuitively and not by the rational intellect. While they do necessary work for us in our awkward attempt to make sense of a motley world of heter heteronymous individuals, such generic class terms do not refer, pace the realists, to ontologically existing universal entities. Now, although histories have been written about nominalism as if it were a coherent body of thought whose identity has survived intact over time, the impulse behind it has always been in tension with that very project. Perhaps even more so than with other such collective terms, the sedimented, adventitious history of nominalism is, I think, much richer than any attempt to still its meaning through a definition that is, as it were, definitive. The difficulty of finding a common denominator, or even family resemblances in the Wittgensteinian sense among disparate iterations of that impulse is intensified when we acknowledge that the term has migrated beyond the confined precincts of theology or philosophy. For in fact, it has become a term to conjure with in aesthetic discussions, especially those that have tried to accommodate modernist innovations in a more capacious understanding of the aesthetic. Now, although there are anomalous impulses in earlier movements like mannerism, perhaps the first explicit use for aesthetic purposes in the modern era, at least the first that I've been able to find, came in an offhand note of Marcel Duchamp in 1914 from his White Box. At the time, he was moving beyond painting to an anti-retinal aesthetic of the ready-made. And this note simply reads, quote, a kind of pictorial nominalism, then in parentheses he says, check. Kind of pictorial nominalism, he's sort of making a little mental note to himself. Now the phrase pictorial nominalism then became the title of a penetrating book by the Belgian art historian and critic Thierry de Duve in 1994. In that work, he interprets Duchamp's provocative challenge to traditional painting as a nominalist rebuke to the essentialist version of visual experience championed uh, during the 20th century by Clement Greenberg and other defenders of a high modernist uh, modernism, rather, narrated as a quest for the purification of painting's essence. Instead, Duchamp, as Thierry de Duve describes him, polluted the visual with the linguistic, redescribed the role of the artist as one of enunciation and judgment rather than creative fabrication, and foregrounded the conventional role of the institution of art in generating artistic value. Here, the notion of conventional, we might note, implied both unintended conventions that existed prior to any deliberate act, as, for example, in the grammar uh, of a sentence or a language, and conventions as agreed upon rules or principles that were designed to inaugurate something new in the world, for example, uh, the Geneva Convention uh, in international law. In either case, what was challenged was the assumption that real universals existed prior to human will, prior to the act, as it were, of creating the convention. Duchamp's critique of retinal painting, art that sought to provide visual pleasure, was, Thierry de Duve argues, also a critique of realism, which lingered in such modernist movements as Cubism, 
Even the second order realism of those abstract paintings that abandon any mimesis of the world on the other side of the traditional painting surface as window frame, that is, a realism of the flat canvas and the materiality of the paint placed on it, even that kind of realism was questioned by what Duduve calls Duchamp's ironic asceticism. What Duchamp shared with medieval nominalism, therefore, was a stress on the artifice and the conventionality of naming, rather than on the alleged essence of the medium. Indeed, not only painting, but even art itself, art we might say with a capital A, was a function of the enunciative gesture of someone who had the legitimacy to proclaim it as such by the institution of art. Where the two parted ways, however, was in their notion uh, of the name. And here I'm quoting. Whereas for the medieval thinkers, names are signs, generally speaking, the words art or painting as they appear in the nominalism of Duchamp are always proper names. Let me repeat that. Whereas for medieval thinkers, names are signs. But for uh, Duchamp, words like art or painting are always proper names. And I'm going to get back to the importance of that near the end of the talk. Now, the privileging of proper names will immediately recall their role in the thought of another figure whose importance for Adorno was immense. And I'm speaking here of Walter Benjamin. Benjamin's Adamic theory of language, based on the idea of Adam in the Garden of Eden, was based on the utopian remembrance of the true individual names originally bestowed in the garden prior to the confusing babel of tongues. Duchamp, to be sure, seems not to have known about Benjamin, and from Adorno's point of view, was himself not really an artist of any great importance. And yet, and yet as I will try to show, when Adorno opened the question of nominalism in musical terms, a certain echo of Duchamp's nominalism of proper names did reverberate. And I want to sort of leave that hanging in the air until the end. Before we try to spell out how that echo sounded, let me pause for a moment with the ways in which nominalism has been frequently understood in musical terms, because there is already a discourse uh, in musical uh, musicology about nominalism. Perhaps its major uh, interpreter was the American philosopher Nelson Goodman, who's, uh, who distinguished in his work Languages of Art of 1969 between what he called allographic and autographic works, allographic and autographic. Whereas the latter, the autographic, were singular objects with claims to authenticity and originality, despite their ability to be re reproduced, uh, think of, say, a signed oil painting. The former, the allographic, were realized only in a succession of material instantiations, such as, uh, say, readings or performances. And here you should think of, say, a literary text or a dramatic script whose original version has no erratic priority, despite, of course, the occasional economic value sometimes bestowed on holographic originals. One way to describe the difference is that autographic works of art can be uh, forged or counterfeited, whereas allographic ones cannot, although they can be plagiarized. In the case of music, Goodman argued that there is a meaningful distinction between notation and performance which allows multiple instantiations of the, quote, same work to appear. Rather than positing a platonic essence which precedes their performances, one that is perhaps an expression of the composer's intention in inscribing the notes as directions for performances, culminating in what came to be called the obligato style, the nominalist understands the work as a complex interplay of original notation and an infinite number of potential realizations. So in other words, instead of saying there is one work that is true, that is then performed either well or ill, uh, there is simply an interplay between notations and many, many performances, maybe an infinite number. Now, the difficulty, of course, comes in knowing when radical departures from the score, either through mistakes or willful invention, make it problematic to regard a performance as still a valid instantiation of a work or, in qualitative terms, as a good performance of it. As Lydia Gurr has shown, the um, very much Adorno-influenced uh, musical critic from, musicologist from Columbia, shows in a penetrating philosophical and historical investigation of the concept of a musical work, it's called uh, the Imaginary Museum of Musical Works, as Lydia Gurr shows, it is by no means easy to grapple with the consequences of a thoroughgoing nominalism. It's very difficult to know when to sort of stop and to say, well, this is no longer the same work. But significantly, in her introduction to the revised edition of that very book, Lydia Gurr notes, quote, that it has been by moving towards critical theory that I have come to have a completely different appreciation of the one view that has generally most offended ontologists and musicologists over the years, the view offered by Nelson Goodman. 
Goodman did not essentialize the work concept. He conventionalized it, admitting the possibility of radical change in its application, end quote. Well, how we have to ask, did the Frankfurt School's attitude towards nominalism help alert Lydia Gert to the virtues of Goodman's nominalist position? Did Adorno in particular have a straightforward attitude towards nominalism in general and musical nominalism in particular? Or was it characteristically dialectical, involving an appreciation of its benefits as well as its costs? Now, in fact, of course, that's the argument I'm going to make, that Adorno, as always, is dialectically complex in his attitude, and so this is not a thumbs up, a thumbs down on nominalism. But nonetheless, I want to argue with Frederick Jameson, and this is one of Jameson's main points in his book on Adorno, that nominalism, quote, is one of Adorno's great themes. So once again, not up and down, but it is still an obsession throughout. Now, to begin answering all these questions, it'll be useful to sample some of the references to nominalism in Adorno's oeuvre, which appear in many different settings. So what I want to do is begin with the more general ones in philosophical context, and then focus on the ones in aesthetic context, and then finally move us towards the ones in musical context. So first, the larger uh, ones that uh, uh, one can find scattered throughout his work. In their critique of the reduction of the Enlightenment to instrumental reason and dialectic enlightenment, Horkheimer and Adorno accused nominalism of going too far, too far in its denigration of conceptual realism, too far in its denigration of the metaphysical tradition of substantive rationalism. They write, quote, Enlightenment finally devoured not only symbols, but also their successors, universal concepts, and left nothing of metaphysics except the abstract fear of the collective from which it had sprung, and, and uh, quote. And as a result, the critical impulse in the nominalist tradition uh, had undermined the critical impulse in rationalism. But then they added, once again, moving in a kind of dialectical reversal, quote, enlightenment as a nominalist tendency stops short before the nomen, N-O-M-E-N, -E nomen, the non-extensive restricted concept, the proper name. So once again, we hear the proper name. We'll get back to it at the end. Now, what this cryptic remark may suggest, we'll explore later when we return to that link with proper names already mentioned in connection with Duchamp. Elsewhere, in his 1959 lectures on Kant's critique of pure reason, Adorno noted the presence of anomalous impulse in the idea of synthetic a priori judgments, in other words, in Kant's first critique. He writes, this concept of synthesis is nothing but the theory of nominalism brought to the highest pitch of abstraction because it declares not merely concepts, but everything that can be meaningfully discussed to be the consequence of mental activity. Moreover, in the criticism Kant directs at metaphysics, we can still hear the echo of the old nominalist critique of universals. We can say Adorno concludes that the foundation of Kantian philosophy is still nominalist. So in the critique of universals, of metaphysics, of ontological truths, of realities that are prior to our epistemological constitution, there is a nominalist critique. He then adds, however, quote, but Kant stands on the threshold of development in which the considerations that led to a radical nominalism begin to turn against themselves. He is the first to have conceived of the relation of universals to the particulars subsumed under them as dialectical. So it's not simply uh, one directional, it's not concepts and particulars, universal, there's a kind of dialectic going on between them. The first one at the threshold, well, who crosses it? Well, it's of course Hegel. Hegel, who is described, uh, described in Adorno's book, Hegel's Three Studies, uh, first published in 1963, as having developed a dialectical method, quote, which is the approach of a consistent nominalism awakened to self-consciousness, an approach that examines any and every concept in terms of its subject matter, and in so doing, convicts it of its inadequacy. Now, this is very interesting. This is not Hegel as a conceptual realist. But Hegel comparing concepts with the material realities, the particulars, and realizing the concepts are in some ways inadequate to those uh, individual particularities, uh, as well, of course, as the particularities may be inadequate to the concept. But he then adds that Hegel's reflection on the self moves beyond the claim that truth is merely a function of the constitutive subject, the claim of subjective idealism. Quote, to an objective idea, an idea that is no longer nominalistically reducible. His version of truth is based on a kind of dynamic Platonism, Adorno argues, in which temporality is included. Or more precisely, and I'm quoting him, Hegel's truth is no longer in time, 
as nominalist truth was. Not, uh, nor is it above time in the ontological fashion. For Hegel, time becomes a moment of truth itself." End quote. Now, what I understand him to be saying here is that the temporality of contradictions, which emerge, sharpened, and then sublated, is part of the truth itself, which is the whole. So the truth is not simply a concept that hovers above, or the particular, but rather the dialectic that moves through them, contradictory towards sublation. From this perspective, nominalism is therefore part of the truth, but certainly not all of it. Later, in Hegel's three studies, Adorno makes a direct, direct connection between the nominalist impulse and the social forces of modern bourgeois society. So here he moves from the level of thought to the level of the social reality. Beneath, he writes, nominalism is part of the bourgeois bedrock. It accompanies the consolidation of urbanism across all its phases, and in the most diverse nations, the ambivalence of that process is sedimented in it. Nominalism helps to free consciousness from the pressure of the authority of the concept that will establish itself as universality. It does so, he continues, it does so by disenchanting the concept and making it a mere abbreviation for the particulars uh, that it covers. So it's bourgeois, yes, but it's also doing some interesting work, disenchanting conceptual realism. But once again, shifting his ground, he continues it goes too far. Why? For such enlightenment is always also its opposite, hypostasis of the particular. To this extent, nominalism encourages the bourgeoisie to be suspicious of everything that would restrain isolated individuals in their pursuit of happiness. And he puts that in quotation marks. The unreflective pursuit of their own advantage as being mere illusion, end quote. Thus, he rather darkly concludes, nominalism, which is anti-ideological, has been ideology from the very beginning, end quote. Hegel, in his attempt to go beyond it, is thus a powerful weapon in the struggle to overcome bourgeois society. So here we see you know, Adorno going back and forth, finding virtue, but also ultimately taking a position that is critical. Nominalism is a kind of ideology in its over-hypostatic relationship to the particular. So not surprisingly, when Adorno then turns to the anti-Hegelian tradition of existence philosophy from Kierkegaard to Heidegger, he discerns a regression to nominalist premises. In negative dialectics, he contends, quote, that nominalism, one of the roots of the existential philosophy of the Protestant Kierkegaard, gave Heidegger's ontology the attractiveness of the non-speculative, in the sense the non-conceptual. Just as the concept of existence is a false conceptualization of existing things, the complementary procedure which these things are given over the concept allows the ontological concept of existence to profit in turn. So you get rid of ontological concepts of universals, and instead you ontologize existence. In other words, despite the nominalist critique of realist metaphysics, it offered existentialism an alternative which jettisoned the critical edge that it impelled enlightenment nominalists. Quote, where consistent enlighteners absolutize nominalism, instead of dialectically penetrating the nominalist thesis too, they recoil into mythology. Their philosophy becomes mythology at the point where believing in some ultimate datum, they cut reflection so short. So once again, nominalism going too far, anti-reflective, turning to its own mythology. All right, in summary so far, Adorno's critique of nominalism as a philosophical impulse with social implications leveled the following accusations. Although he appreciated the value of its challenge, the absolute authority of generic subordinating concepts over particulars, he balked at the nominalist ontologizing of those particulars as utterly unmediated by concepts. Despite its theological origins, he saw nominalism as really coming into its own with the secular disenchantment of the world wrought by bourgeois modernity, in which individual self-interest and self-preservation trumped any claims to collective solidarity. While admitting that it fostered an active subjectivity, he charged it did so at the cost of obliterating the integrity of the objects dominated by the constitutive subject. And that's a very crucial point. Let me repeat that. It does foster an act of subjectivity, but it does so at the cost of obliterating the integrity of objects, which are then dominated by the constitutive subject. Though that subject, at least in its transcendental guise, could itself be understood by, uh, undermined rather, by a nominalist critique of universals, the stress on the will in the nominalist tradition, whether divine or human, meant some sort of complicity with the domination of nature abetted by the dialectic of enlightenment. 
In other words, you get rid of reason, you put will in its place, before you know it, you're dominating the external world. So too, the nominalist emphasis on linguistic constructivism led to the problematic exaggeration of the sovereignty of language over the world of recalcitrant materiality. In short, in many respects, Adorno echoed a time-honored anxiety about the implications of nominalism that extended back to theological debates about its explication uh, and its implications. And there are lots of debates about nominalism that I could you know, point to. Various footnotes uh, would, uh, I think, give you uh, some of that uh, literature. All right, so what we have here is a suspicion, but nonetheless a grudging and an admiration for aspects of nominalism in general. But what then is the, result, is the role of nominalism in the realm of the aesthetic in general and music in particular for Adorno? Did he merely repeat his philosophical critique in, as it were, a different key? Did he identify it, as Rose Rosengart Subutnik has written in her book on Adorno's music, with a musical condition, quote, obviously antithetical to interaction and consequently to meaning? In other words, she's saying he's putting it down. Or, or were there ways in which nominalism served less dubious purposes? Uh, when art rather than philosophy or science was involved, thus allowing other observers, such as Peter Uwe Hohendahl, to go so far as to speak of, quote, and I'm quoting Peter, U uh, Peter Uwe Hohendahl, the radical nominalist stance that Adorno adopts with regards to art, end quote. In other words, we have a kind of debate in the literature on his attitude. In Adorno's posthumously published aesthetic theory, the first mention of nominalism comes in his crucial discussion of aesthetic semblance, Shine is the German, in which he argues, quote, that the truth of artworks depends on whether they succeed at absorbing into their imminent necessity what is not identical with the concept, what is according to that concept accidental. The illusory quality of artworks is condensed in their claim to wholeness. So the illusion is the wholeness. What they have are accidents which are in excess. And art's truth, its ability to get beyond the illusion, is the ability to, in a way, acknowledge that otherness, the accident, that which can't be absorbed. Now, it's this illusion, he claims, that nominalism challenges. According to Adorno, and I'm citing him again, aesthetic nominalism culminates in the crisis of semblance, insofar as the artwork wants to be emphatically substantial. The irritation with semblance has its locus in the object itself, not the constitutive subject, not the artist, not the creator, but in that object which is, uh, in a way, in excess, uh, something that is not either conceptually or creatively uh, exfoliated out of the subject. Reflecting on such passages, Sherry Weber Nicholson writes, quote, this emphasis on the importance of the non-identical and non-subsumable detail is by another name, Adorno's aesthetic nominalism. And it is part of the dialectic of illusion or semblance. Nominalism, so Adorno contended, organizes works of art, quote, from below to above, not by having its principles of organization foisted on it by a concept or uh, by a generic uh, uh, universal, which suggests its affinity with, and this is a kind of perhaps uh, uh, political moment in this argument, a democratic rather than authoritarian culture, from below rather than from above. But then drawing on his critique of philosophical nominalism, he never gives it up entirely, he hesitates before fully endorsing the wholesale demolition of universals. He writes, the philosophical critique of unreflective nominalism prohibits any claim that a trajectory of progressive negativity, the negation of objectively binding meaning, is that of unqualified progress in art. Though it is nominalism that helped art achieve its language in the first place, still there is no language without the medium of universality beyond pure particularization, however requisite the latter. So you see him tacking back and forth dialectically. Yes, accident. Yes, the particular. Yes, the nominalist impulse. However, still concept, universal, something that uh, is generic. Thus, if left entirely unchecked, nominalism at its most cor corrosive ultimately liquidates, and I'm quoting him, all forms as a remnant of spiritual being in itself. It terminates in a literal facticity, and this is irreconcilable with art. So art to be art can't just be particulars can't just be objects, because that's just to be uh, the factual world uh, that is, in a way, uh, prior to and beyond art. Art must have something that resists that. Now, there has been, Adorno notes with concern, a secular trend towards the domination of the particular over the universal in the history of Western art, which is best evidenced in what he calls, quote, the decline of artistic genres as such. 
Art, he says, has been caught up in the total process of nominalization's advance ever since the medieval order was broken up, end quote. Benedetto Croce, he notes, was perhaps the first philosopher of aesthetics to understand that each work, each indi individual work, had to be judged in its own terms rather than as an example of a given type, a conclusion that had escaped Hegel, he says, in his history of aesthetic progress. So nominalization, each work unique, each work irreducible to a generic type. And yet here, too, it would be mistaken to miss what remained of the older faith in generic forms, indeed, ironically, in the universal concept of art itself. The dialectical approach registers the tensions in that concept, at once abstractly universal and yet performatively yearning for concrete particularity. For Adorno writes, quote, the drive towards nominalism does not originate in reflection but in the artwork's own impulse. And to this extent, it originates in the universal of art. From time immemorial, art has sought to rescue the special. Progressive particularization was imminent to it, end quote. But, once again, hacking backwards, when it entirely forgets its generic universality, it risks effacing the very boundary that separates art from the random particularities of everyday life, which Adorno calls, quote, unformed raw empiria. And the history of the bourgeois novel, interestingly, he says, <coughs> the rise of the nominalist and thus paradoxical form par excellence illustrates the danger in this effacement and anticipates the fate of later art as well, for, quote, Every loss of authenticity suffered by modern art derives from this dialectic, end quote. In art, in other words, formal generic types are thus more than exhausted conventions to be discarded with scorn. They're necessary as the constraint against which particular works always measure themselves, for without them, the latter lapse into pure contingency. Though often abetting authoritarian social norms, conventional genres can also serve to resist the status quo. Why? Because of their distance from the naturalistic conduct of quotidian existence, that facticity into which art might fall if it lacked generic tension. They also serve as a healthy check in the arbitrary willfulness of the aesthetic subject, the alleged genius who invents entirely out of thin air. So this is an interesting point, that the generic uh, forms, you might say, the universals, the conventions, are ways to get beyond the notion that artists are themselves simply geniuses creating ex nihilo, uh, an overly narcissistic notion of artistic creation. And as a result, and I'm quoting, the relation of the universal in the particular is not so simple as the nominalistic tendency suggests, nor as trivial as the doctrine of traditional aesthetics, which states that the universal must be particularized. The simple disjunction of nominalism and universalism does not hold. So disjunctions, no, but a complicated dialectic, yes. Modernist art, which in general was championed by Adorno, as we know, might be understood as the culmination of this very long process of nominalization. But here, too, his dialectical instincts discern the counter pressures of formal universalization. He writes that in nominalistically advanced artworks, the universal and sometimes the conventional reappears results not from a sinful error, but from the characteristics of artworks as language, which progressively produces a vocabulary within the windowless monad. So language, which always has generic elements, somehow is a check on absolute nominalization. Expressionist poetry, for example, he says, adopted some of the color conventions that were promulgated by the visual artist Vasily Kandinsky. Expression, he writes, the fiercest antithesis to abstract universality, requires such conventions in order to be able to speak as its concept promises." End quote. And yet Adorno concludes rather pessimistically the trend was moving inexorably away from the creative dialectic of convention and transgression, and not because of the internal aesthetic pressure of nominalization alone. The crisis of meaning in art, he writes, imminently provoked by the unstoppable dynamism of nominal nominalism, is linked with extra aesthetic experience. For the inner aesthetic nexus that constitutes meaning reflects the meaninglessness of the world and its course as the tacit and therefore all the more powerful uh, a priori of artworks." End quote. Well, all right, with these general considerations about Adorno's dialectical relationship to nominalism behind us, we can now turn to the real matter at hand, the ways in which the issue was treated in his writings on music. Now, what first has to be acknowledged is that the application of a philosophical category developed in a context that was originally explicitly theological to the very different realm of music, well, this can only be an exercise suggestive but imprecise in analogical imagination. 
As in the case of other such transfers, for example, Duchamp's notion of pictorial nominalism, the results can't be held to very rigorous standards, I think, of definitional clarity. Although Adorno shared Nelson Goodman's interests in the issue of performance, and in fact, he also attacks the goal, quote, of perfect immaculate performance, observing the work, quote, at the price of its definitive reification. In other words, the idea of the absolute work, which is then merely performed well or ill, is a reification of that work. He did not reduce the question of nominalism simply to the distinction between pure and impure renditions of an original. For Adorno, all art was the site of productive, if always unstable, tensions between concept and material, semblance and truth, generic form and concrete instantiation, wholeness, and what transgressed it. Totalized integrity, to be sure, might be a regulative ideal, but ironically, only works that fail to achieve it could be understood as, quote, authentic works of art, at least until the society out of which they emerged was itself a reconciled totality, if that ever might happen. Thus, as Lydia Gurr has noted, he kept his distance from the platonic notion of Werktreu, of being true to one work, and, quote, thought that the cost of listening to works only as they're offered in final or perfect aesthetic appearance or as perfectly performed is that we lose sight or hearing literally of the construction, form, and work labor that makes the work the master works they sometimes are. So the work is in the performance, not simply in that initial notation. Adorno, moreover, also argued that, quote, to consider works as made, as opposed to their being perpetually in the making, tends to play into a deadening or industrialized desire not really to experience the works at all. So works are open-ended. It's in the process of experiencing them, not in the process of worshiping them as fixed and uh, somehow ended, uh, that aesthetic uh, uh, happening really occurs. What also has to be understood, however, is that Adorno was always enough of a Hegelian to think historically and to eschew essentialist arguments about music or any other art. Thus, rather than positing eternal definitions of artworks understood as either categorically platonic or nominalist, he spoke of a process, a process of nominalization, a secular trend away from essential forms since at least the end of the Middle Ages, but one that could be disrupted or perhaps even under certain circumstances reversed. And as we saw when citing his claim that, quote, nominalism is part of the bourgeois bedrock, it accompanies, remember, he says, the consolidation of urbanism across all its phases, uh, as we noted then, he tied, albeit somewhat loosely, to the larger socioeconomic context in which the history of art had to be situated, even as it could also be understood uh, as well in terms of its imminent developmental logic. But when does nominalization really pick up steam? in the Western musical tradition, tipping the balance away from working within received forms to their tacit abandonment or even explicit subversion. Well, in aesthetic theory, Adorno notes, quote, that the sense of form in Bach, who in many regards opposed bourgeois nominalism, did not consist in showing respect for traditional forms, but rather in keeping them in motion, or better, in not letting them harden in the first place. Bach was nominalistic on the basis of a sense of form, end quote. He then continues shortly thereafter to argue, quote, that in an artist with the comparable level of form of Mozart, it would be possible to show how closely that artist's most daring and thus most authentic formal structures verge on nominalistic collapse, end quote. But it was really in Richard Wagner, who, quote, was the first case, if this philosophical expression be allowed, the first case of consistent aesthetic nominalism. His work, Adorno tells us, is the first one in which the supremacy of the individual work, in the individual work, that of the concrete, thoroughly constructed form, becomes, as a matter of principle, completely realized against all kinds of schema, schemata, against every externally pre-given form. He was the first, Wagner was the first, Adorno says, to draw the conclusion from the contradiction between inherited forms, indeed, the inherited form of the language of music, on the one hand, and the concretely uh, arising artistic tasks on the other. It was perhaps, however, in the atonal music of Schoenberg in the Second Vienna School, the music whose impact on Adorno's own practice as a composer and ideas and aesthetic theorist was profound, it was in Schoenberg that one might locate the most powerful culmination of the modernist nominalist impulse. What Schoenberg had famously called the emancipation of dissonance meant the end of the tyranny of traditional tonal hierarchies. As Adorno put it in Philosophy of New Music, Schoenberg's school, quote, obeys without excuse the actuality of an accomplished nominalism. Schoenberg draws the consequences from the dissolution of all binding types. 
in music, as was implicit in his own laws of development, in the emancipation of ever broader levels of the material, and in the progression towards absolute musical domination of nature. For Adorno, the greatness of the early Schoenberg was precisely his unflinching embrace of the nominalist dissolution of form, which allowed him to avoid the dubious search for organic wholeness and reconstituted authenticity that Adorno, of course, decries in Stravinsky. Now, it was because of this identification with the early Schoenberg that commentators such as Peter Hohendahl and Sherry Nicholson were able to discern a positive version of aesthetic nominalism in Adorno's position. Max Patterson, in his book on Adorno's music, helps us to understand his distinction between destructive and constructive versions of nominalism by foregrounding his two concepts of form. The first quote from above to below, the second from below to above. Patterson writes, the first kind of form can be understood in relation to the handed down pre-given genres and formal types imposed on the material from above. These represent a level of universality. Uh, Adorno calls it schlechte Allgemeinheit, and are normative, the form being organized from totality to detail. The second can be understood as form which emerges out of the, quote, inner necessity of the material from below. It represents the nominalism, i.e. self-identity of the particular is critical and moves from detail towards totality. But for all of his praise for Schoenberg's expressionist atonality as a weak form emerging from below, that final ominous phrase in the citation that I gave you above from Philosophy of New Music, quote, progression towards absolute musical domination of nature, reveals, I think, Adorno's longstanding fear that both a philosophy and an artistic practice that sees the world as inherently a chaotic manifold, a manifold then open to the unchecked power of the subject whose will can impose an arbitrary new order on it, that these are complicitous with the instrumental rationality that has emerged from the dialect of enlightenment. And such an outcome, in fact, Adorno did charge was manifested in the next stage of Schoenberg's career, a stage that Adorno did not find as congenial as its atonal predecessor, that of the 12-tone row, serialism. Schoenberg, he writes, was the first to detect the principles of universal unity and economy in the new subjective emancipated Wagnerian material. His works adduce the evidence that the more rigorously the nominalism of musical language, inaugurated by Wagner, is pursued, the more completely this language allows itself to be rationally dominated. It is this rationality and unification of the material that makes the initially subordinated material entirely compliant to subjectivity. So you, hear, you see here a kind of anxiety that nominalism, uh, because it allows free range to a dominating subject, leads to domination of nature. Paradoxically, by regularizing that subordination through rigid rules of composition, the pendulum swung too much in the opposite direction, and the healthy subjective moment of musical expression was in danger of being snuffed out in favor of an impersonal method. The problematic implications of this shift he discerned in Anton von Webern's last works, which smacked, he claimed, of reification. By the time Adorno wrote his rather dark ruminations on the aging of the new music, this text of 1955, Adorno could warn, quote, that the effort to rationalize music completely has something useless, something frantic about it. It applies to a chaos that is no longer chaotic. It is time for a concentration of compositional energy in another direction, not towards the mere organization of material, but towards the composition of truly coherent music out of a material, however, shorn of every quality, end quote. All right, so he's moving us away from the 12-tone row, even in people like Webern, whose works he often uh, praised. Well, what might that other direction look like? It's not easy, I think, to see, but the dialectic of form and formlessness, that inexorable process engendered by the ruthless nominalist subversion of universals uh, of any kind, was not entirely over. As many observers have remarked, it was now apparent that what Adorno was to call musique informelle, informal music, a term he introduces in a seminal essay of 1961, an essay included in his collection, Quasi in Fantasia, Musique Informelle. He defines it, quote, as a type of music which is discarded all forms which are external or abstract or which confront it in an inflexible way. Sounds very nominalistic. At the same time, although such music should be completely free of anything irreducibly alien to itself or superimposed on it, it should nevertheless constitute itself in an objectively compelling way, in the musical substance itself and not in terms of external laws. 
So all right, there are no, let's say, generic types, but this is also not now licensed for the composer to impose. Comparing it to the atonal musical breakthrough that occurred around 1910, but noting the intervening serial revolution, Adorno says, quote, the musical, music en formel must deal with the contradictions and problems facing music at a stage when an unconstrained musical nominalism, the rebellion against any general musical forms, becomes conscious of its own limitations, end quote. He cannot therefore go back to the early Schoenberg. He can't go back to atonal music. The music of expressionist atonality is a dialectic of music and society has simply moved on. Now the challenge, the challenge of music on Formel is to face the fact, quote, that the more urgently the structural arrangement insists through their own shape on their own necessity, the more they become guilty of acquiring contingent matter external to the composing subject. So the more they insist on their own shape, they uh, begin in a way to submit themselves, to surrender to the contingent matter, external to the composing subject. Now the stress on the exigency of this contingent matter external to the composing subject means that older notions of nominalist art, quote, which had always imagined that it could locate its enduring core and substance in the subject, are wrong. Why? For this subject now stands exposed as ephemeral. So the dominating subject, the transcendental subject, the genius, the subject that does all the constituting, this subject too is broken down. The old romantic, an expressionist subject whose interiority was objectively realized in artistic form is a thing of the past, as antiquated as the ideal of organic wholeness in the work. What now demands to be acknowledged is the fact that the musical material of today, and he's writing in the 60s, quote, is not simply the subject in its own right, it also contains the element of what is alien to the subject, the element of otherness, end quote. And thus, John Cage's music, and Adorno is very keen on Cage, uh, has to be applauded, quote, as a protest against the dogged complicity of music with the domination of nature. Cage, which, as you know, uh, allows, in a way, something to be heard, doesn't insist on what should be heard. This does not mean to be sure an unelectical privileging of that contingent otherness, which would then invite the positivist flattening out of aesthetic semblance, which it always is in danger, uh, in danger in a kind of unchecked nominalism. For all the importance of sonority, of just sound, music cannot be reduced to nothing but noise or sound. It would be wrong, Adorno argues, to believe in the critical function of the note as opposed to the configuration, as if it were an immediate good, uh, as opposed to a superstructure and to imagine that the note from which all meaning has been removed could nevertheless supply its own meaning. Meaning, on the other hand, should not entirely uh, be ascribed to the relations among notes, especially a constructed relationality imposed by the composer, as the material is often in excess of any such attempt to master it. Without abstracting, abstractly rather, negating any and all subjectivity, music must somehow find a way to open itself up to what the subject cannot spin out of itself or intend with no remainder. That is, quote, it must become the ear's form of reaction that passively appropriates what might be termed the tendency inherent in the material, end quote, which is not turned into a dead object to be dominated by a sovereign subject. In short, a musique informelle must avoid, quote, the hostile extremes of faith in the material and absolute organization. If it succeeds, end quote, and I'm quoting now, it would emancipate itself both from projects which are purely subjective and from thing like objectifications. It would present itself not as an object to be described, but as a force field to be decoded. Very interesting use of that term, often in his vocabulary, a force field to be decoded. Now, in that force field, and this, I think, is the, the final twist in Adorno's complicated argument about nominalism, in that force field, there's a claim made by material that is always in excess of conceptual or structural or compositional control. To make this point clearer, Adorno suggests a comparison expressing an important lesson of much modernist art, which involves the element of surprise that results in the process of composition not being entirely controlled by the subject. It is, he says, quote, much as a chemist can be surprised by the new substance in his test tube, end quote. Now, it's very interesting that a similar argument uh, has been evident in the discourse about another chemically involved process, that of pre-digitalized photography. Here, the indexical trace of something in the recorded image that was not intended to be captured by the photographer signals the resistance of the world to the subjective power of the artist. 
The result is what can be identified as another version of nominalism, uh, but one which avoids a problematic reliance on a voluntarist, we might call it dominating subject, human or divine, uh, the ability of that subject to impose his or her will on a chaotic manifold. Now, in a very different context, an essay on photography, I've called this magical nominalism, a term that uh, is, of course, extrapolated from the more familiar idea of magical realism. Uh, and I try to argue that in some way it helps to re-enchant the world. I mean, I'm not completely happy with the idea of re-enchant, but I think it gives us some sense of what is done by it. Uh, and what I mean by it uh, in, in this way, uh, drawing on several theoretical sources, including the work of Rosalind Krauss, Terry Duduve, and W.J.T. Mitchell, the argument invokes Benjamin's Adamic theory of true names, names that are not conventional but somehow mimetic which brings us back to the issue left dangling earlier in the paper when we invoked Duchamp's reference to pictorial nominalism. Now, Duchamp's focus, it'll be recalled, was on the proper name, which is individual rather than generic, somehow expressive of the essence of that individual in a kind of particularized way, a kind of rigid designated or rather than a collective name or shifter, like I, he, she, or they, that can serve as an interchangeable term for many different qualitatively distinct entities. So it's not a shifter, not a generic term. Now, Adorno, as we know, was deeply indebted to Benjamin in many ways. Among them, his fascination with the utopian impulse in proper names. As we noted earlier in Dialectic of Enlightenment, he and Horkheimer acknowledged that the corrosive power of Enlightenment, quote, stops short before the nomen, the non-extensive, restrictive concept of proper name, end quote. Shortly after this observation, they add that in Judaism, quote, the link between name and essence is still acknowledged in the prohibition on uttering the name of God. The disenchanted world of Judaism propitiates magic by negating it in the idea of God, end quote. Now, such a negation, like the famous Bilder Verbot, a prohibition on images of God, is always in the service of a utopian possibility that cannot be realized now, but must not be entirely abandoned in, as a future redemptive hope. That possibility is of a world in which the endless displacement and deferral of meaning is finally stilled. The subsumptive logic of gen general terms is undone, and individual names and the essences they designate are finally, or maybe once again, one. Lord, how does this all manifest itself in musical terms? There is, as stressed earlier, no simple translation of philosophical concept into aesthetic equivalence and a fortiori into music where language is at its most indirect and attenuated, and yet, and yet without understanding the theoretical sources of Adorno's dialectical attitude towards nominalism, we cannot, I think, make sense of how it operates in his writings on musical matters. The issue is nicely raised in an essay by Gian Mario Borio, an essay on the question of meaning in Adorno and the musical avant-garde, which flags precisely the importance of Benjamin's theological notions of language. Borio writes, and I quote, transferring these ideas to the realm of music, Adorno works along the path of secularization. The linguistic gesture of music, and I want to emphasize gesture, mimes that impulse with which man seeks to enter into communication with the supreme being by means of prayer. As, quote, the human attempt, futile as always, to name the name itself, not to communicate meanings. So let me read that, it's very complicated. The linguistic gesture of music mimes that impulse with which man seeks to enter into communication with the supreme being by means of prayer, as the human attempt, futile as always, to name the name itself, not to communicate meanings. Now, this citation at the end of the sentence, the human attempt, futile as always, to name the name, not to communicate meanings, is from Adorno. It's from Adorno's 1956 essay, Music, Language, and Composition, in which he claims, quote, that in comparison to signifying language, that is a language that always communicates, that always intends meaning, music is a language of a completely different kind. Therein lies music's theological aspect. What music says is a proposition at once distinct and concealed. Its idea is the form of the name of God. It is demythologized prayer. Demythologized prayer. Freed from the magic of making something happen, the way some as you pray for the crops to uh, you know, be uh, uh, bountiful. It's freed from that. It's the human attempt, futile as always, to name the name itself, not to communicate meanings, just to praise, just to say God's name, just simply uh, to gesture. Music, to be sure, cannot do without its meaningful elements. 
It cannot do without the relational patterns that somehow signify. It's striving, as it were, for coherence. But it also conveys something in excess of meaning, something beyond intention, something beyond expression, something that, like the proper name, just is and cannot be interpreted in other terms. It doesn't mean anything else. It's not an exemplar of anything else. And as a result, music cannot be decoded, reduced entirely to language, reduced entirely to notation of any kind. Or as Adorno puts it in another essay of that same era on the contemporary relationship of philosophy and music, written in 53, quote, in music, what is at stake is not meaning, but gesture. Not meaning, but gesture. As language, music tends towards pure naming, the absolute unity of object and sign which in its immediacy is lost to all language. In the utopian, and at the same time, hopeless attempts at naming is located music's relation to philosophy, to which for this very reason, it is incomparably closer in its idea than any other art." End quote. In music, Adorno continued, getting the name right is equivalent to the absolute as sound. But it cannot appear without the mediation of the compositional rationality and intended meaning that thwarts its direct appearance. It is, he concludes, the paradox of all music that as an effect towards that intentionless things for which the inadequate word name was chosen, it unfolds precisely only by dint of its participation in rationality in the broadest sense. So this is a kind of aporetic, complex, negative dialectic. The riddle of music, the riddle, an important word for Adorno, its eternally enigmatic character is due to the fact, quote, that it does not possess its object is not in command of the name. Rather, it longs for it, and in so doing, aims at its own demise. So it's like a prayer, a prayer for something that uh, will end the need for prayer. In short, the magical nominalist impulse in music, it's striving not only to get beyond intelligible real universals uh, to the qualitatively unique particulars beneath, but also to thwart the sovereign constitutive power of the dominating subject is the reason it could be said to function like a secular version of prayer. It manifests a yearning, a yearning for a bliss beyond the interminable displacement and deferral of meaning, for an absolute that overcomes the tension between subject and object, for a state in which aesthetic semblance is no longer needed as an illusory antidote to a fully administered world. But, and I want to conclude with this thought, through the gesture of multiple performances, the mark of an allographic art in Nelson Goodman's sense, music gives us a glimpse of that bliss as an infinity of mimetic repetitions and similarities of echoes and resonances, and not the static, death-like perfection of a platonic utopian order. This, in other words, is a nominalism not in the service of bourgeois disenchantment and the domination of nature, but rather of its very opposite, a nominalism that is indeed magical in all of its implications. Thanks very much for your attention. Yes, yes. I just thought, I'll just use the word beautiful. I just feel the themes that you're talking about are so powerful. And I just want to play with this word prayer. Right. It's all, it's all these things that been repressed. Liturgy. Liturgy as um, that theology, as we've done it, we've derived, we've tried to start to explain, to conceptualize, but liturgy originally was prayer, it was just to call the name, just to be in prayer, to be, now they would say be with God, I think we could say be with each other. Um, we could talk, we can call it secular, but it's this sense of being carried, being carried through something rather than the will. And so that's really what I was talking about with the darkness. There's this whole and, and you're saying playing out with nominalism since the 14th century. It's the whole, where does the will be belong? Where does the Protestant will belong? And where does liturgy and prayer and just being with, and I'd say being with each other,
We don't, it doesn't have to be, it is spiritual at one sense, but it doesn't have to be a transcendent God. So I just, I think the concept of prayer is so powerful. Thank you. I mean, I, I'm by no means a serious student of all of the ways in which prayer has been uh, discussed, defended, uh, criticized, whatever. It's a very, very fascinating speech act of prayer. And one of the ways, the uh, we might call instrumental ways, to pray for someone's health or for the cross, but that's not what they're talking about here. They're talking about simply that rather strange act of praising God, of naming God, of doing something that has no function. Uh, I mean, why does God need to be praised? Why does God need to be named? I mean, uh, it, it's a kind of a mystery why the uh, somehow action of doing that is uh, an action that God uh, is pleased by. It seems very bizarre. But it is uh, an act of, in a way, non-instrumental, non-communicative um, affirmation, uh, which has a yearning in it. I mean, there's some sense of it expressing our uh, insufficiency or the humility of the human or the lack of uh, our sovereignty or something that says that we are, uh, if not fully heteronymous, at least not fully autonomous either, and therefore subverts the idea of the overly strong will uh, either in terms that might be construed of a God who is just willful in a capricious way, or the idea of self-assertion, the idea of human domination, the idea of human sovereignty. So uh, the Frankfurt School, and this is one of the ways in which it has a kind of nuanced, I think, critique of Marxist humanism, has always been nervous about an overly human humanocentric version of things. I mean, that's why nature, the other, the uh, what is uh, mimetically rather than uh, conceptually dominant, all that involves a kind of, if not surrender, which goes too far, but at least an awareness of that dialectic between uh, our need for meaning, our desire to control, our desire to act, and also the humility that we should have uh, to avoid the kind of depredations of the world that might result if we act uh, without having the humility of uh, music or theologically prayer. So I think it's, it's an interesting uh, kind of check on a certain humanist uh, hubris, if you will. I've been reading Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain over again as a as an old age project that we all plan on. And uh, in there, uh, Sartre Marini uh, talks about music as evil or uh, corrupting. And Adorno at one point talked about um, Negro jazz being like that, that he found the sexuality of it was misplaced in the saxophone. And I think he made major error in that. And your paper brilliantly describes how he deals with other music. And I'm, you know, it's very suggestive and powerful. But I think the evil of music is part of prayer. That it's not simply adoration, but uh, the thing I can think of it being most explicit, Nina Simone singing a song that goes like this, Mississippi, God damn. And that's a prayer. And it's an other order of prayer, the evil order of prayer, God damn Mississippi. And the music there is as powerful as Thelonious Monk and does all of what you described toward the end of your essay. But the end of your essay seems to move into a kind of esoterica or the kind of music that uh, Sartre Marini and Lenin condemned. You know, it was kind of interesting parallel that it makes you want to uh, pat the head of a wolf. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a very complicated question. I mean, obviously, Adorno had his own uh, very, very nuanced uh, analysis of different uh, musical trends, different composers, different uh, eras in a particular composer's uh, you know, work. So one would have to really pick apart the judgments that he makes rather than talk about music with a capital M. Uh, 
And clearly there's a great deal of controversy over his uh, discussion of uh, popular music and jazz. I don't get into that here. Uh, there have been nuanced defenses of aspects of it. It's not quite as simplistic as some people have charged. Uh, I, I like your, your introductory remark about, uh, about Thomas Mann because, of course, Adorno was uh, very close to Mann and helped uh, him write uh, Dr. Faustus. And uh, the way in which he describes the 12-tone row here as problematic is then picked up by Mann, and Leverkuhn uses it in ways that are, um, you know, in the novel itself problematic, much to the chagrin of Schoenberg. So Adorno uh, translated uh, Schoenberg into an idiom that uh, Mann was able to uh, appropriate in that work as a kind of evil. Now, evil is a very charged word, but of course, in Magic Mountain, you know, the, uh, the famous, uh, the Lindenbaum song in, uh, in, you know, the Schubert Lindenbaum, which ends with, that refrain, uh, Dufendus Ruadort, you will find rest there. There's a kind of utopian sense of yearning for a moment of repose, a moment when you can say, you know, as in Goethe's Faust, Weile doch du bist so schön, that it's so, uh, th this is the moment where you will, you know, finally say, yes, this is, this is the good moment, this is the moment of fulfillment. The music uh, contains at its best, and we could argue what that might mean, that promise. Now, it, of course, can be used for ill as well, and Adorno would have no uh, dispute with that, and he has his own cast of villains. Uh, I mentioned Wagner, he has problems with Wagner, but others later, like, uh, say, Hindemith or Sibelius, uh, Stravinsky, he obviously has critical things to say about them as well. So, you know, one could pick it apart in terms not of just music, but specific exemplars. Um. This is really just a request for a clarification and perhaps a little more explanation. But um, did I, was I correct in hearing you say that, um, that Adorno's position on musical nominalism changed or developed between philosophy of the modern music and some of the late essays, specifically with regards to the evaluation of John Cage? Um, now, I don't remember exactly if if or what he says about Cage in Philosophy of Modern Music, but it does seem to me that unlikely that it would be a positive response. So if it is the case that there was a shift there in, 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 um, in it became in a sense more nominalistic, uh, um, if that, I heard you right in that respect, I wonder what is the, what, what do you think was the motive within Adorno's work for, the, for that shift or development? Because it, it does seem to me that you're right. There is, in the very late essays in Adorno on music, a much more um, appreciative um, attitude to certain forms of music that are not part of the 12-tone school. Right. I mean, the aging of modern music is uh, an admission that uh, history has moved beyond the early uh, second Vienna School moment, and that we have to go with what is new. So Boulez or whoever happens to represent that Stockhausen, I mean, he moves beyond. Now, my understanding is that he, he doesn't talk, I think, about Cage in philosophy of modern music. I mean, that's in the late 40s. Cage, I think, is not on his radar at that time. So I've, I'd be interested, I'm sure I could find some footnote where he talks precisely about Cage. What he finds in Cage uh, attractive is that moment of openness to the ambient noise, openness to the material, as it were, coming to him, the lack of the composer's constructive interference with that, the surrender, as it were, to the atmosphere rather than the attempt by the artist to uh, completely and totally uh, direct every uh, possible moment uh, in the uh, musical experience. Now, it is, what, four minutes, 33 seconds, so it's uh, in, a, in, in a frame. It's not uh, simply uh, the noise that we f hear in everyday life. So there is something still aesthetically constrained. There's something still that allows someone like a Cage or a Duchamp to give us, as it were, a ready-made. I mean, uh, the ready-made is not made by us. It is something that we can constitute as aesthetic in a kind of post-facto way. Uh, and that allows something that comes from an aesthetic legitimacy to then bestow upon that seemingly random experience something that gives it aesthetic meaningfulness. And Adorno, I think, is moving towards an anomalism that he would not, but I called magical in the sense that it allows the power of that external world to be felt. I mean, that's why I, I was very pleased to find that uh, citation about chemistry, about, you know, looking at the test tube and, aha, there's something I did not expect. Uh, and Krakauer, his great friend Siegfried Krakauer, when he discusses photography, 
is very, very sensitive precisely to that. And in a recent piece I did in Krakauer, which also uses this magical nominalism term that I'm trying to push, it argues that uh, Krakauer was very, very aware of the fact that the indexical trace in pre-digital photography often is in excess of the compositional work done by the photographer, either while he or she is framing the image or in the post-production uh, work done uh, in the lab. So that there's a way in which the surprise, the aha, the uh, what I call in another essay the kind of Bartian uh, punctum that uh, was not expected is part of the photographic experience. And I think in musical terms, Cage is close to that. I mean, allowing noise, ambient noise, and there are other, you know, 20th century uh, artists, 20th century musicians who also allowed ambient noise to penetrate as well. Um, so it's not something Cage invents, but I think Adorno appreciated it precisely for that reason. Yeah, if, if I can just follow sure, that, though, with sure. the second part of the question, is, 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 it's not just that these people came along later, right, and that Adorno had to, Adorno was not the sort of person that just accepts something just as it came along. No, what, no. What, what I, was, I, I appreciate what you said, but what do you think was lacking in the philosophy of modern music or the form of nominalism that he proposed there that would lead him to be uh, open to these other kinds of developments, which are significantly different? Well, my, my uh, uh, you know, top of the head question, uh, off the top of my head question, uh, response to that question would be this, that he likes the atonal music of the early Schoenberg, dislikes the 12-tone road. This is rather, you know, uh, uh, let's say flat-footed as an alternative, but I think that's, that's the way that work plays out. The atonal music still involves expressivity, still involves a strong expressionist uh, moment of uh, perhaps the suffering subject or the subject who, uh, who has an interiority that is being expressed in uh, often quite powerful ways in the music. So there we get um, a nominalism which is still, as it were, in cahoots with that earlier, more conventionalist nominalism, which the subject is, as an expressionism, um, foregrounded. He never liked the, uh, n you know, the Neue the new objectivity that came later, because that, the pendulum went much too far in the other direction, towards reification, towards uh, an overly objectivist, anti-subjectivism. But somehow, by the time he got to Musique en Formel, uh, there's an openness to a kind of, let's say, pendulum swing a bit back away from the subject, towards allowing a non-reified object uh, to have its due. So I think that's what's going on. You know, we'd have to maybe look at the text more carefully, but that would be my reading of the shift from the early expressionism, the atonal moment, a certain kind of anomalism there, emancipation dissonance moment, to then that moment which is expressed by, uh, say, Cage. Yeah, um, thank you very, very much. Um, one of the reasons I'm really, really happy that you have presented such a lovely paper on Adorno is because Andrew has been bugging me for the longest time to explain what non-identity thinking is. Andrew, this is non-identity thinking, okay? <laughs> I, I, um, I do have a problem though with the, the magic nominalism. Okay. I, okay. I, because really what you've described is, is precisely what Adorno means by non-identity thinking. So, that's more comment. Well, you know, magical is a funny term, and I, I, you know, he doesn't like myth in various moments, and magic uh, is something that he also has some trouble with. But I found a couple of quotations, if I can pull them out of my footnotes now, where he says things about the magical, which suggests that it's a term that is, uh, you know, that has a kind of positive valence. So I'm going to, you know, go as far as I, as I can with it. Um, but I understand I'm slightly nervous about it, because, I mean, magic has its own negative uh, implications, and certainly this is not, uh, you know, return to the occult or whatever. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure I could come up with it right away, but I, I can, you know, certainly later give you that. But I think it is true that the non-identical, if it means anything, is the dialectical interpenetration, but not, of course, absolute opposition between universal, concept, uh, generic, whatever you want to call the formal uh, ways in which we use language on the one hand, and everything that is in excess of that, that is sort of squeezed into it through subsumption, but yet somehow uh, is uh, basically um, more than that, qualitatively distinct from it, um, in, uh, uh, let's say, the capacity to be placed in another constellation. So I think that's the main sort of impulse uh, that emphasizes non-identity, not as a moment of uh, historical uh, alienation, which then has to be overcome, uh, 
a la Hegel is most triumphalist, but itself is part of a redemptive constellation, which keeps the tension going. That essay that somebody mentioned earlier, the subject-object essay, uh, I think captures that very nicely, that subject-object, meta-subject, all of these are in a constellation. And the term constellation, force field, he mentions it here a couple of times, crucial term, different from sublation or Aufhebung or the term that I think is perhaps more clearly a Hegelian term. Um, so I, th that would be, I mean, a Andrew and I have gone over this uh, many times as well, but I think that would be my, I share your sense of that, that's what it means. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this um, yeah, undescribably interesting and inspiring talk. Maybe just a footnote um, on one way in which there might be a link between nominalism or the nominalist tradition and I really mean the medieval tradition and music theory, something that is uh, surprising to myself when I think about it. But um, one of the famous wordings that we get from the nominalist tradition in medieval theory is to speak about the presence of universals as a mere flatus voces. Yes. And that means a mere breath of the voice. Right. And somehow that seems to, right. you know, um, add up to what you try to develop as a form of magic nominalism through through music. So it is an indirect presence of mm -hmm. that which cannot really be expressed. Mm -hmm. No, I like that. I mean, I, I think one way, I, I've really not done sufficient um, work on uh, medieval musical theory and to see whether or not there is a uh, dialogue between philosophical nominalism and some of the musical um, practices and theories of the period, but I think you're right that that metaphor does suggest that there's something going on of a transfer, and I, I think it's an excellent suggestion which I will uh, definitely try to uh, pursue. Thanks. Thanks so much for this really rich paper. Um, I um, f feel that I, I find myself that by the time you articulate your magical nominalism at the end, I have two possibly opposing reactions. One is that maybe we're no longer talking about nominalism, M-I, N, but no men really, with really the emphasis on the name, right? Which gets you really quite a distance away from the original nominalism versus realism, universalism debate. Um, but I don't want to be too Derridian about this and say you, know, you should spell it differently or something like that. The, the other impulse is to go back to something you mentioned almost in passing, which is Wittgenstein's family resemblance view of concepts. And I wonder um, whether you could maybe speak a little bit more about that, because that seems to be kind of Wittgenstein's way of getting around this kind of bad dialect, either bad either or between nominalism and realism. Well, uh, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, the Wittgensteinian um, uh, insight into the ways in which we make sense of commonalities without subsumption. Uh, the way we make sense of the ways in which there are overlaps without uh, a clear conceptual frame uh, is very helpful in this type of exercise, in intellectual history in general. Let us say I'm using the word nominalism as if there were some continuities, even though I try to say different than conventional and magical. So uh, I think we have to accept the Wittgensteinian sense of there being, um, you know, let's say a useful uh, blurring, but nonetheless overlap between various uses over time. And I think if we did a full unpacking, we'd probably find uh, still others. Now, the most difficult thing, and I'm not sure I have this right, is the issue of the proper name, the real name, the Adamic name, which really is magical. I mean, the idea that somehow in the Garden of Eden there were real names and then uh, Babel created this conventional uh, you know, infinity of uh, names that were simply uh, imposed and uh, one is just as good as the other and so forth. Uh, the relationship between that and the idea of being true to the material particularities of the world. I mean, you have to go pretty far into, let's call it magic or some sort of uh, non-scientific thinking to assume that there are somehow objects in the world which have real names. Um, now, Benjamin seems, I mean, Benjamin was a guy who went over that threshold. You know, Benjamin was willing to sort of take that stuff seriously. Does Adorno? Well, you know, sometimes he seems to. And there are a few places here where I think he's, you know, channeling Benjamin. Other times I think, well, he's kind of saying it, but maybe he doesn't really believe it. Whether we should believe it, whether or not it ever will happen, you know, it's not going to happen, but whether or not it's ever a kind of convenient, useful uh, standard by which we measure 
the inadequacies of our lives, well, that's something else. I mean, maybe it is a kind of, I don't know, a regulative ideal, asymptotic point we never reach, whatever you want to call it. But it is something that at least certain people in certain circumstances fantasized about as an antidote to uh, the infinite deferral of meaning, to metaphoric, metaphoric, metaphor. I mean, all the things you think about, a la, let's say you mentioned Derrida, a kind of world in which uh, displacement is the norm and uh, in which Entstellung is constantly uh, you know, moving us away, displacement from our Stellung. Now, without going back to uh, a, uh, you know, a kind of rigid Stellung, and that's why I finish with that notion of the allographic, it gives us the possibility of an infinity which is a good infinity rather than a bad infinity. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, let, let's say struggling. These, these are the, the kind of threshold of at least my ability to make sense of uh, this tradition, uh, but I think that's where they are, you know, at least pushing us. All right, well, uh, on that note, um, in any case, on that note, I'd, I'd like to thank you again, Marty, for such a, a, a brilliant talk. Please join me in. Uh,